Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Spencer, and today I'm going to talk about building modules. Now, we've heard earlier today, um, or earlier this week, sorry, about more about modules, but I'd like to really dive into how we're actually going to build modules. But first, who am I? I've been an LLVM and Clang developer for about nine years now, member of C++ committee for about five years, working mostly on language evolution and more recently some, uh, li uh, sorry, library evolution and more recently some uh, language evolution stuff. I am on the Clang team at Apple, working on shipping Clang in Xcode. And uh, um, recently a lot of that work has been focused on modules. Now why am I actually giving this talk? So about a year ago, uh, or I guess earlier this year, we had this uh, modules might be dead on arrival blog post. And, and in general, a lot of concern about how we're gonna build modules. And, and, and the main thing here is, can this proposal actually be implemented successfully? And today I'm here to tell you, yes, we can. So how am I, how am I gonna do that? Well, first, modules are new. Not everyone knows exactly what modules are, so we're gonna go into a bit about them. But more from, from a perspective of um, how they're built and, and what they actually are and what they're not. Then we're gonna cover the dependency problem, that is, uh, headers form dependencies and modules form dependencies, but modules form a different kind of dependency. Then we're gonna take a look at different build strategies and how they resolve these dependencies. Then we're gonna take a look at the mapping problem. We have to go from a module name to a module interface. How do we do that? We're gonna see how pre-scan impacts this. And then we're gonna take a look at some existing build systems that have either already implemented uh, some module support or are, are in progress on it. First. What are C++ 20 modules? Well, there are a few things. Primarily, and, and first of all, they are a way to organize your code. So headers allow you to organize your code, um, but modules also do. And so here we have two modules. We have our left pad module and right pad module. They're separate, they're separate files. They both define a module interface, and they both export some functions as part of their interface. Now, there's nothing really new here. These, this is just code organization, you can do this with headers. But modules do some extra stuff. So they're also a way to encapsulate your code. Much like object-oriented programming, you can have, uh, you can encapsulate your members, share them with who you would like. Modules allow you to do that. Here we have two different module interfaces, left pad, but this time we decided that left pad is a really hard function to implement, so we need a little helper function. And format, it's also kind of hard, it needs to left pad, so clearly it's gonna use some other module to do that, it's not gonna do it itself. And it also has a helper function. And these both define these, and they're both actually defined in the, the translation unit that defines the interface, but there's no ambiguity here. Format cannot see the name helper from left pad. So there's no ambiguous call, and this is fine. This is different from headers. You can't do this with headers. Additionally, macros are a way, oh, sorry, not macros. <laughs> Modules are a way to isolate your code from macros and from other declarations and other things. Here we have three different translation units this time. Our left pad, we define, decided to define min to something before we export some stuff. Format, we import left pad. We also import algorithm. We import the header this time. And we decide to call std min. And then over in our main function, we define min to max and then import a bunch of stuff and then use it. This code all works, and it actually calls std min from algorithm. Format module does not see the define in left pad. And the define in main does not go into format or left pad. Modules isolate. You have a question? Can you go to the mic? Uh, which definition of main is actually of min is actually present at the bottom of main? It seems to be importing one definition uh, after it's already had a different one. Of of min? Yes. There's no import. Macros are not imported through modules. Thanks. Yeah. And so there's there's no issue here. And this is this is really important. This is really critical to the next thing, which is a way to speed up your build. Without this isolation, you cannot get the speed up. Because the isolation says that no matter where this module is used from, it means exactly the same thing. Now, 
Modules are a lot of things, but there's also a lot of things that they aren't. And there's been a lot of confusion around this. So first of all, modules are not a namespace. Name lookup in, uh, in, in C++, in your normal code, is not impacted at all by modules other than things being visible or not. It does not impact scoping. So a module's name only appears in module declarations and import declarations. It doesn't appear anywhere else in your code. Modules are not a build system. The standard has never defined a build system. Builds have always been implementation defined. And modules don't change anything here. Everyone has a different build system, and we're not trying to step on your toes with modules. We're allowing you the freedom to implement modules in a way that makes sense for your build. Additionally, modules are not a packaging system. This is not defining any artifacts, things that you can ship around. Um, and there's, there's things other than modules that you need to ship around part of, as part of your build. Like you have .os and .as and .dialibs and stuff. And those are all part of packaging. Modules don't solve that. Modules are also not a distribution format. The standard makes no mention anywhere of module artifacts, BMIs, or anything. It just talks about module interfaces, which is source code. And modules are not related to libraries. There's no correlation between a module and a library, like a .a or a .dialib. In fact, you could, for instance, define a single boost module and have every single library in boost be part of it. Or, so, so you can spread the implementation of a module across different libraries. Additionally, a single library can define multiple modules. So it doesn't change anything related to that. Now, modules adds a couple new translation unit types. And these are important because they impact how you build things. So the first is the module interface unit. There's one of these for each module. It defines the interface of that module. There are also header units. These are uh, normal C++ headers, but taken and put into their own translation unit. And we can see this example here. We have our module left pad, and we're actually going to uh, fill out what this declaration actually is. So we import string here, and then we define it. And this does not textually include string. This goes and builds string as its own independent translation unit, and then imports the declarations that it contains. Now, additionally, we have module in, uh, implementation units. These are different. They don't have export, but they do name the module, and they are part of that module. And they implicitly import their interface. So much like when you have, when you have well componentized C++ code today, you have a header and you have an implementation file. In your implementation file, the first thing it always does after you define your header guards is you're going to include that interface. And so we just do that implicitly here. And you can define things from that module. You can't put export here. This is not an interface. It's an implementation. But this defines left pad. And no other module can define this left pad, because this is uh, left pad's left pad. Now, additionally, we have non-modular TUs. These are the TUs we've had since C plus 98, and even before. And the only thing new is that they can import modules. They are not a module themselves. They are a member of the global module. And they can use modular things. And like before, there's no namespacing. This left pad is the left pad function. I don't have to like do left pad dot left pad or left pad colon colon left pad. It's just left pad. Now, additionally, there are module partitions. And really, you can just think of these as module interface units. They have mostly the same properties when building. And they allow you to split up an interface. So you can split your module into multiple. So like you'll, you know, you'll have headers, you'll have your big header, and then it might call, do some detail headers. So it's just a better way to organize code. And they're spelled module name, colon, partition name. And there's actually two ways to build them. So the first is the same as a normal interface unit. There's basically no difference uh, in, in how you're going to tell the compiler to do it. But there's actually an additional way, and it's all at once as part of the primary interface unit. And there are some cases where you may want to do this. Uh, Clang currently does this when it actually does Clang submodules, which are not part of C++. Uh, modules, but for Clang's things, it actually does it this way. It builds everything at once and plays some vi uh, uh, visibility games to get them to admit the right thing. Now, how do we actually represent this module interface? The first, and actually the best, uh, I would say, is textually. 
the C++ source code of the module interface is the most portable and the most readable form of your interface. And th so this is actually what your interface is. It contains your macro, like any, uh, any if def, any preprocessor things you're doing, it contains all your comments, it's beautiful. But it's not the fastest to parse. So we also have a BMI, or a built module interface. And this is the artifact produced by compiling a module interface. And it may be binary, or text, or ternary, or whatever you want. Standard does not define this. And it is integrally tied to the specific compiler that produced it. The standard doesn't define these. They are not portable between compilers. And additionally, they, they are often not even uh, portable between versions of the same compiler. Um, to do otherwise would overly constrain implementations. Modules expose basically every part of C++. Any change we make in our internal representation changes these files. Now, how do you build an individual, sorry, yes? Uh, question, Mike? Yeah. Um, does it depend on the target um, yes. that's being used? Yes, depends on, on every most like command line options. Okay. Thanks. I'll actually get to that. But um, now, how do you actually build a model? So you call your compiler, tell it you're in C++ 20 mode, and you pass it um, a module. Now, you, you'll need some extra command line flags for some cases, but let's just focus on a single module for now. Now, if you're compiling a module interface unit, you're going to get a BMI. You're going to get this, this artifact. Now, additionally, you're going to get a .o, maybe. Now, now, why is this a maybe? Well. There's two different ways that you can, you can handle a, a module interface. So here we have a module interface. We've fleshed out the implementation. And you'll note that there's implementations here. And we actually have a non-exported, non-inline helper thing. If you tried to do this in header world, and you included this twice someplace, you'd get a multiple definition error. Because you're textually including something in multiple translation units. Here, modules own the entities, and they're, they're their own standalone translation units. And so this definition has to go somewhere. And so we're generated .o. Now, if we change this to inline, that changes things. It changes the ABI. And here, what we're saying is that we actually want other translation units to be able to inline this code, to be able to optimize it. We want to get this inline linkage. And so here, we uh, need to emit this code into the BMI. And then everybody that uses it needs to code gen it. But they don't need to code gen helper, so we can still get a .o. If we made everything in here inline, we don't actually need a .o. We can rely on everybody else in, uh, code genning it. But that's not always the best option. And Clang actually has an option, f modules code gen, which says we, we already have this translation unit, and we know one module that will, uh, one translation unit that will always be able to build it. So we'll just submit a definition in there. And we'll give everybody else the chance to inline it, but they don't actually have to. If they choose not to, they don't have to spend time optimizing. Now, for a module implementation unit, you're just going to get a .o. These, for, for build purposes, these are exactly the same as your normal translation units. Now, there's a problem. So we have the dependency problem. There's lots of dependency in C++. Currently, uh, we have include dependency. And you include, you, an include depends on the file that it includes. And this is really simple. Like, the build system just needs to know if the file changed just for, like, invalidation purposes, but nothing really else is complicated here. Now, imports depend on exports and on header units. And this is slightly more complicated, but in the end, it's really just a graph. So we have a graph here. We'll take a closer look at it. So in this graph, we have our format library, our format and module interface, which depends on the left pad module. But really, you'll see this split up into two, into two boxes because we have implementations and we have interfaces. And so format doesn't actually depend on the entirety of the left pad module. It only depends on its interface. And so this is what that exploded out looks like. Now, for header dependencies, both of these lines form dependencies on a specific file. They actually deform dependencies on, if they were the same name, it would be the exact same file. They use the same rules for header search. These are not like different things. So your dash i's will find the same thing. The import form of this has isolation, though. Nothing from utils.h is visible in string. And both forms 
bring macros into scope. Now, this, this is including string, which is a standard library header, which happens to be an importable header. And this may be turned into an import. It's implementation defined if this is turned into an import. But what this is saying is that, uh, and this is a feature used for uh, converting old code, or not even old code, it's your existing code. Like, you can't just have a flag day, or it's very difficult to just do this, where you're gonna be like, I'm gonna turn everything into imports. Well, but what about my old compilers? I'm still shipping on, on this old platform. I need to keep supporting it. Well, you can still use modules without doing that. And this, is, and this uh, header uh, to import translation does that. Now, module dependencies, both of these lines form module dependencies uh, on the interface. The first line is implicit, it imports line number, and the second one is explicit, importing left path. And both are isolated. Nothing from line numbers is visible in left path. And no macros are brought into scope for named modules. Now, modular dependencies and header dependencies are different. Modulars, modules are isolated and always start with the same state. Thus, they can be separately compiled, cached, and reused. Now, there's this little star here on always, and there, there are cases where you can't reuse things. And that is when the modules are compiled with two different uh, like settings that would impact the AST. You can't just use the wrong AST. You would have ABI issues. Um, and you can actually uh, get ODR issues. Uh, but in general, in most cases, you're gonna get reuse. But this reuse and caching does have some overhead. We, we need to look into that. So what's the overhead module? Well, so for once per module, not per use, but per module, you've got to set up a new state. So like new compiler state, you've, your preprocessor and, and, and AST, all the stuff needs to be reset. You run phases one through seven of translation. So that is essentially from like mapping the source, the bytes on the disk into the source character set all the way through uh, preprocessing and template instantiation, but not linking. We stop there, stop at seven, and then we serialize. Write it out to disk, and then we deserialize on each use. Now this deserialization is very, very cheap. We do lazy loading. Uh, I think all of the compilers are doing lazy loading. So it's not, so, so the, import, the, the load cost or import cost is not, does not dependent on the size of the module. It's, it's pretty much constant. It's on the number of imports you have. Now, incremental builds influence this too. So, it's kind of obvious, but incremental builds, you don't need to rebuild the modules you depend on. In headers, if you change any, any headers in the include stack or, or the final translation unit, you have to rebuild everything because you don't know what the, the interdependencies are. You don't have isolation. Here you have isolation, so you don't need to build on what you depend on, but you do need to rebuild everyone that depends on you. There have been ideas floating around of like, maybe we can do super detailed tracking of what people depended on and used, but it, it, if you actually like look at, look at it, it's not really something you can do. It's essentially you're gonna have to rebuild everything that depends on you. And so we have this trade-off. Modules fundamentally, they, they trade off synchronization for deduplication. And what does that mean? Well, in the header world, there's no synchronization. When you, like, two different translation units can include a file, and it's read. They're both reads, no synchronization needed, no races, you're good. But they deduplicate work. There's no work sharing between that. You always have to deduplicate work, or sorry, duplicate work. Modules, they say, well, let's not duplicate that work. But how do you do that? Well, you do the work once and then you share the work, which means that you have some synchronization. You both can't go off and share this work before it's been done. Like we live in a, a like we have time, time goes forward, can't go backwards. But this trade-off really depends, like how this trade-off impacts your build depends on the shape of your build. And now, every project is different. Every project is a different shape. You've got one file, millions of files, no external dependencies to, you know, if you have a good package manager, you can have thousands of them. We have some circular dependencies, deep dependency graphs, shallow dependency graphs. And all of this impacts how fast you can build. And it also impacts the effectiveness of incremental builds. So let's take a look at some, some build graphs 
and, and see how this actually impacts them. So here we have a build graph. At the bottom of the, the graph is a single translation unit, and it depends on eight things, or it depends on in things. Now, what, what does this look like in a file, like an actual source code? Well, in the header world, this would be include A, include B, include C, et cetera. And in this world, where you have a single translation unit, it does not matter how much parallelism your build environment has, you have a max parallelism of, of one. You have a completely serialized build. In the modules world, you actually have as much parallelism as your uh, build environment has. And you go as wide as you would like. And you do have a cost on the thing importing all of these, but that cost is, is very small and is, is essentially it, uh, on the order of the number of entities you use from these different modules, not the size of the modules. Now, as we saw earlier, this is more realistic. Um, still not actually realistic, but slightly more realistic. You've got these interfaces that actually have implementations. Now, in the header world, your parallelism goes as wide as you have implementations. As, long, as many translation units as you have, you can go that wide with, with headers. Um, but you still have that one translation that's going to be the long end. It's going to depend on everything. And with modules, uh, you're not. You're going re to reuse it. You do have to wait until you build all of those header units or module, module interfaces before you can go ahead doing the rest of it. But it scales ridiculously. But not a real build. Let's look at a more realistic build. Now, this is a more normal project. You've got your, your main application down here over on the left, and your little helper over on the right. You depend on some mid-level libraries, which depend on some higher-level libraries. And for real projects, you're, you're actually much bigger than this, but this is what fits on a slide. And then here, well, for headers, your, your max parallelism is 10. Two at the bottom, five in the middle, three at the top. And your min parallelism is also 10. Because there's, you don't care about, like, these relationships exist, but you don't care about them. You're just going to duplicate the work. But for modules, your, your max parallelism is, I believe, seven. But you have a problem with your, your min parallelism. Those three module interface units at the top of the graph, you have to build those before you can build anything else. So it's three. Now, you may be thinking, well, my parallelism is less. That's bad. So there's a couple things that influence this. Um, first, what, what's your build environment? How actual parallelism do you have, and how wide is your graph? Um, in practice for us and our builds, um, we're essentially already saturating everything. Um, but if you, have a, if you have a wide enough build environment, you will see a higher wall time with modules. Your actual wall time will be higher. But there's another thing that impacts this, and that is um, incremental builds. When you're developing, you're, you're in your development cycle, most of your builds are going to be incremental. And if you're touching this, this main app down here or this little helper app, you're not rebuilding all the, that header, you're not reparsing it, and since you can all the templates and stuff, you're just rebuilding that thing. And so that is essentially always faster than headers. Always. Now, if you're modifying your top level things, depending on your build graph, you can have a a taller wall time, because you're essentially doing the same amount of work as headers, but you're inserting serialization overhead. Now, as your, your build graph goes out, or as your build environment gets wider and wider, you hit, the, you hit the limits of a single machine. You might start to go to multiple machines. And you may want to share those machines between developers. Why am I going to have a build farm for like every single developer? I don't think that really makes sense. And Modules reuse, headers don't, headers duplicate. So your actual resource utilization with modules, even with a higher wall time, is drastically reduced. It is, it is actually quadratically reduced. The bigger your project, the more savings you get with modules. Now, we're gonna take a look at another build graph. And I really hope no one's project looks like this, but this is actually terrible for modules. This is like the worst possible case. This is module depends on interface, which depends on interface, which depends on interface, and so on. So uh, you have zero reuse in this, or one reuse if you assume um, each of these is a uh, component that has its own CPP. Essentially, like two reuse, or one, yeah, one extra use. And 
for this last one, you have to wait for everybody else. And if you're, so like you have some super wide machine and you schedule this poorly where every single module builds on a separate thread and you've got all this cross-thread communication and stuff, like you can have terrible results. But this isn't a real build and we actually have a solution for this, for modules. We can be no worse than headers here. Um, but there's actually is an upside for modules here. Incremental builds again. If you're modifying this bottom thing, you're not paying for any of that. Any of that other work. But with headers, you have to do that every single time. All of that work. So when we're building modules, we have this dependency problem, but we also have another problem. Um, module name to module interface mapping. This is really easy for header units, as you just do header search. There's no coordination needed. Now, you may want to do some coordination if you're doing, if you're doing BMI buildings, building the BMI for the header unit. But this is kind of hard for named modules. It's not trivial, like you have to do some work. We have to find a module interface before we can import it. And how you find it can be influenced by how you build. So first we're gonna take a look at some build strategies. Now I have, I have three main strategies here. The first one is actually treat it like a special header, just treat it textually. Don't build a BMI. This is totally something we can do. The standard does not contain, does not define BMI, it doesn't have you to build them. You can totally do this. The next build strategy is to implicitly build on import. We see, we, the compiler sees an import, it's like, hey, I need the module. It goes to tell somebody else. It's like, oh, I'll go build it, cool. And the last way is to explicitly build all, all modules you depend on before you actually get built. So you go, so the compiler goes to build and it sees an import, and it's like, oh, hey, I already have it, that's cool. So let's take a look at textual modules first. Again, you don't actually have to build a BMI. The way this works is you go find the interface source file, check if it's already been imported, much like header guards, stash the macro state, hide all the currently visible names, textually include it, and then compile, and then merge the, the namespaces and uh, the, the, the name tables and uh, uh, macro states. And this has all of the other benefits of modules. You get your core code organization, you get encapsulation, and you get isolation. And you get nearly identical performance implications as headers, and potentially even slightly better because of uh, assumptions we can make. And the, your module name acts as a header guard, and there's no synchronization overhead. Um, but it does duplicate a lot of work between uh, translation units. And you may think this is some weird thing that nobody's gonna do. Well, Clang actually has all of the infrastructure for this today. Um, we have uh, uh, Clang modules, which when we actually build submodules, we do submodule visibility, and we just concatenate all of them together as one giant translation unit and insert some magic compiler internalness between them to say, hey, we're going to a different module. Yes, and this build strategy actually works very well for uh, distributed builds. Yeah, and this can work, and, and so Gabby was saying this can work for distributed builds because you can just ship off the entire thing. Um, and so essentially, modules will never have a worse build performance than headers. Now, for implicitly built modules, we check if the BMI already exists in the cache. If not, the compiler goes and builds it itself, uh, then it loads it. Now, this has great performance if everything is in cache. You know, cache hits are great. Uh, the build system doesn't even need to know they exist, no build system changes. Not so great with a clean cache. Um, you have to deal with locking and racing on who builds it. Um, it turns out just locking doesn't quite work, uh, so sen sometimes you will have races. Um, and you have to deal with invalidation. And this is actually really hard. Uh, the build system doesn't know anything about these. It doesn't know when they need to be rebuilt. So the compiler has to impl implement invalidation. And let's say you have in translation units in your build. You go to build all of them. You import im. Um, m divided by two will say uh, um, uh, module interfaces in each of your translation units. Well, each of those independent compiles has to check the invalidation. There's no coordination here. They all have to check it. There is a quadratic number of stats in this. Every include, everything, it's quadratic. We've hit this, other companies that have deployed modules have hit this. This is why everyone has moved away from implicit builds. Uh, additionally, we've actually also had a lot of bugs 
doing this. And it's, it's, it's not been great for us. You also have this problem of how should it be built. You've got this translation unit over here. Like, module interfaces are translation units. What do you do today when you build a translation unit? You have a command line for it. I don't have a command line for this. I just have to go find it and build it. Like, what, do I, what flags do I use? The same flags? What if some transla other translation unit is building it with different flags? Are those compatible? I don't know. You, you have all these questions. Now, you can fix a lot of these problems with implicit coordination. And uh, this is uh, essentially module mapping as described by Nathan in P1184 and Boris in 1842. And this fixes the locking and bracing issues. You have a central coordinator. It, both compilers come in and say, oh, I want to build this module. And then, you know, it, it, it mediates that dispute, decides who gets to win for that, for that. And it also potentially fixes how to build. You can tell your, your implicit coordinator um, how different things should be built. The compiler doesn't have to guess. It, but it, the problem is, is that it doesn't help with work scheduling. The, you're essentially generating work dynamically. The compiler does not know ahead of, sorry, the build system does not know ahead of time the critical path to your build. So it cannot optimally schedule work. Now, explicitly built modules, they're pretty simple. Builds are handed to the, um, uh, to the B, builds are handed the BMIs they need from the start, and you just load what imported. Now, this has the highest potential performance. The build system can optimally schedule all work. The build system handles invalidation. So that we, again, we do not have this quadratic problem. We go from quadratic to linear. This is huge. But it does require knowing dependencies ahead of time. And that brings us to the mapping problem. All build strategies need to map between module names and module interfaces, and even between header names and, B and header BMIs, header unit BMIs. Now, we have three options here. We can explicitly maintain this mapping in the file, so like say, my module is over here, and this module is over here. We can have a file system convention. We can say, uh, module names matching this pattern um, go in this folder structure. Or we can do a pre-scan. Ahead of time, we can just look at all the files and see what, what goes where. Now, take a look at expli explicit maintenance. You've got a file that has a bunch of these mappings. Say module name is path to module name on CVVM. Now, this works okay when you have a few modules. It's fine. Like, it's a little file. It's okay. Um, it's a maintenance nightmare when you have a lot. And it gets even worse if you're trying to track dependencies. This, this is as if you had to have a file that mapped all of your headers. So you say, this header is at this path, and this, this header includes these headers, and this file includes these headers. Like, that's terrible. No one would ever do that. Uh, but, I, but I do actually expect some um, small, this, this to work okay for some small projects. Like, if you have two files, whatever. Doesn't matter. But as your project grows, this becomes uh, untenable. Now, there's also a file system convention. You could say my dot module name lives in my slash module name. And this works fine, even for a lot of modules. Um, it does have some downsides. You have a lot of increased stack traffic due to searching for various module paths. And it highly restricts project structure. Everybody has a different project structure. Everyone has different file extensions. Everyone has different naming conventions, different tab stuff, different editors. C++, we, we like our differences here. Um, but every different product structure, you've got to add this to your, your search. And so it increases, like, it, it further increases the number of stacks. And it may not actually work for third-party modules, because that other project, it's going to be using a different structure than you, most likely. So now you've got to handle multiple different product structures, or you have to, like, have an explicit list for your third-party modules. There, there's some problems with this. I, I do think that some build systems when they just say, you've got to restrict your product structure, and some products will be okay with that, they'll change to that, and it'll work great for them. I think it'll be fine. But this isn't going to work for everyone. Now, the last approach we have is a pre-scan. And a pre-scan uses a tool to determine what each file defines and imports. And it works well for any number of modules. There's, there's really no limit here. It provides the full build graph before the build begins, so we can follow the critical path, can optimally schedule. And it handles invalidation once, not per compile. The build system knows about everything. And it works great for third-party modules. You do have to point it at them to scan them. 
but it can just go off and scan them, it's great. But what about performance? We're going to go and scan every single file in your project. How can that be fast? Well, we have this great tool, playing scan depths. Um, we've been working on it on my team at Apple. And um, uh, Alex and I gave a talk at LVM Euro that goes down into the details of how it's implemented, but I'm going to give a brief overview here. So, Plain Scan Depth is a pre scan tool for explicit modules. That is the purpose for which it was built. And given a compilation database, which is a list of compilation steps, uh, of, of compilation, compiler invocations, so it knows all the command line flags. It knows exactly how your build is going to build that file. It returns a module build graph. And it is correct. This is not some like regex guessing thing. It handles like if defs, it handles raw strings, escape through lines. When you say given a compilation database, would a, for example, just the main CPP would suffice? No, you have to say how, what the command line arguments are for every thing. So if you need to list every module, isn't it du duplicating the wor work a little bit? Or the scan devs requires a list of files and then it's going to go in the files to build the graph? Um, so this is. No different than what you're, like, so modules are translation units. What do you do today? You list all of, all of your translation units in your build. So yes, you have to list all your translation units. There's nothing different here. Um, but yeah, so it's correct for all this, and it, it's, it handles ridiculous stuff. We've run this on a significant portion of our code, which is dating back to like the 80s in some parts of it, and it's, it, like, we've not hit anything it can't handle. There is one case that I currently don't handle, that we currently don't handle, and that's if your dependencies depend on underscore, underscore, line, underscore, underscore. So if your imports depend on the line that they appear on, it's not going to work for you. Uh, and I, I don't really care. <laughs> we, we could actually make it do it. it. It's not hard, but it would, it would, it would slow it down some. Um, and this actually works. It actually like, it fits into the standard, actually. We run phases one through three of translation, and then we do a partial phase four. What is the actual build system that you've been using for this build? Uh, so when I, uh, for, the, for the output of this? No, no, when you run your own whole build, what's the thing that co runs these things? Your like build is system, it Ninja or is it Xcode? What is it? Your build system needs to run this tool first. What are you using currently for these tests? Ah, I've been doing prototypes, so right now I've been having like a Ninja thing do it. Right. This is not production done yet. Um, uh, but yes, it, or was I? I forget. I'll go to the next thing. Thing. So, but what about performance? So, this thing is actually really fast. Uh, it's three seconds for all of LLVM and Clang of a 15-minute build, and that's 7,000 files and 3.8 million lines of code. And this is on an 18-core iMac Pro. This is multi-threaded. It shares things. Um, and actually, only 33 milliseconds of this are reading files and doing the minimization. The rest of the time is spent in Clang's full preprocessor. We haven't rewritten the preprocessor yet. In Clang's full preprocessor, it gives you all those nice little character di diagnostics, which means that it like, does all this tracking of macros and source locations and all this ridiculous stuff that we don't even use. We can actually make this significantly faster. I'm pretty sure we can get this to, uh, easily get this to under a second for all of you in Clang. And so out of a 15 minute build on this machine, we essentially view this as free. Now, what about existing build systems? What are they planning on doing? Well, first, we've got your existing make build system or your existing Python script or bash script or, or whatever you're doing um, that isn't going to be easy to change to do explicit. Well, it, it would kind of be ridiculous if, it, if it's a huge project to change this to do explicit builds. Explicit builds expose the full builds of the build system, meaning you have to change your build system. It's going to be easiest in this case to do implicitly built modules. Now, there's a couple ways you can do this. You could explicitly list all the modules for the module mapper, um, but that has all the problems of explicit modules. Now, if you're, you, you could also use the pre-scan. You can still do a pre-scan with this model. You pre-scan, you populate a database, and then you do an implicit build that looks it up in the, the pre-scan database. Or you can use a file system convention. So any of these will work. They're going to have different performance trade-offs, but in this model, don't expect amazing performance. You're going to have the quadratic stat problem, and 
You're gonna have uh, the build system not really knowing how, to, like, it, it, it doesn't know about all this other work. You've additionally got the compiler spawning extra work that the build system doesn't know about, so you may oversubscribe your system. Um, but I think that this will work fine for some projects. But don't, like, go do this and then see their performance and be like, oh, the models don't work. There's no, there's no point in doing it. You need to understand the, the overheads and the trade-offs that you're making. Now, for CMake, uh, we're pretty good safe here, actually. The developers are actively engaged in the C++ committee. They show up to the committee meetings. They show up to all the tooling subgroup calls. And they actually already handle Fortran modules, which are actually kind of worse or harder to handle than, than C++ modules. They allow multiple modules per file and some other weirdness. And they're doing it by explicitly building modules after a pre-scan. Now, we have build two uh, from Boris over here. And earlier he gave a talk, and he's actively involved in the committee also. He shows up to committee meetings and shows up here. Um, and to, to all the tooling stuff. And uh, so build two implements a module mapper service for includes and does a pre-scan for named modules. That's right, right, Boris? Cool. Now, Mason, I actually don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, there's, a, there's a GitHub issue right now that's currently tracking this. It looks like they're planning on doing pre-scan. Yes. I am the maintainer and lead developer. That cool. is not true. There are people who want us to do a pre-scan, but we, are not, we don't want to do that. Okay, but you don't but want I have further questions once the thing is fully yeah, over, so let's cut back to that. Okay, so correction from the uh, head maintainer of this. Uh, there were some thoughts, but they don't necessarily want to do that yet. So I guess we're not quite sure what Mason can do yet. Now, Ninja, Ninja's not really a build system. Ninja is a build executor. But thanks to the folks over at Kitware, CMake, um, recently got support for dynamic dependency edges, discovered via pre-scan. And with this, CMake can target Fortran and C++ modules. Now, I want to recover a few points. So the first is that modules are translation units. All of the build properties that you think about when you think of a .cpp, they, they transfer over to modules. There are some additional semantics and things you need to think about for building, but they're translation units. Next is that modules provide isolation. And this is the fundamentally new thing that they do in C++. It does not matter where they're imported from, they only care about themselves. They don't care about anybody else. They're kind of selfish. And with modules, you trade serialization for deduplication. There's this trade-off. You have to think about that. And the impact of this trade-off depends on the shape of your build. If your build has a single point dependency edge, that's a serialization point. And you've got to wait on that. And you may want to break that up. And explicit builds with a pre-scan are fast in practice. We've done this internally, and it, it's worked pretty well for us everywhere. And so I encourage uh, looking at the solution. And with that, are there any questions? Yes. You knew I was going to be here, didn't you, Michael? Yeah, all the <laughs> modules people. We've um, been out of each other's talks. Yeah. So you mentioned my mapper protocol thing. And I think the way you described it seriously misrepresented what it was intending to achieve. And also the way you described make build systems um, okay. uh, using it. Because mm -hmm. did you see my demo in Kona or not? I don't know if yes. you're in the room. Right, okay. Yeah. So for the benefit of everybody else, I did a proof of concept of adding mapper technology into GNU Make. Um, so I don't believe that kind of approach has the quadratic behavior you described in your slide there. You, you don't have to have the, the, the make can figure out the dependencies? It doesn't have to, um, the compiler doesn't have to check when it loads the module? No, it's a channel from the comp compiler to the build system, whatever is actually in overall charge of spawning compiler jobs, right? And then that thing will either have complete knowledge already, or it will get knowledge from the compilers that are asking it questions and therefore can implicitly infer there are these dependencies. And then the next time in an incremental build, it will have presumably cached that information and then has complete knowledge 
of the bits of the graph that don't change and mm-hmm. the bits of the graph that do change that it will know about because it's done the thing of I need to spawn that will learn new dependencies on the next build. How that much is kind of the intent there. Yeah, how much modification of the build system does that require? Is it a one place or do you have to teach it well, more? Well, clearly make has to know how to build things that it that it's the that it's the build that it's the make file for. It will already know for that particular component. Okay? Mm-hmm. And that's the problem being solved. Now, the the issue of how does it know how to build uh, modules from dependencies, I hadn't addressed there, okay? But for within a particular project, you will have a make file that knows how to build, f- given a qu- request to build a CMI, it will know what to go build, mm-hmm. right? This is a way of injecting the the request to build those CMIs during the build that it didn't already know about because it didn't know the imports. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the now, now clearly, what, sorry, you mentioned that the, 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 what will happen is obviously you com- a compiler that got spawned will have to sit there waiting, consuming memory while something else is building. So that's the the, the resource that is being held uh, that wouldn't be held if you built things in the right order. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, there there are ways with implicit coordination. Um, where the build system has some knowledge of it to uh, uh, get rid of the, the, the quadratic tap behavior. Yes. yes. I didn't want people to go away thinking yes. that it was only solving that implicit thing. It yes. provides a mechanism by which the, the compiler and the build system could communicate dynamically if they wanted to. Yeah. And yeah. also it I, avoids, I avoids each comp- compiler having to load up this some kind of database of mappings. Mm-hmm. The build system presumably has this in, in memory and it just can yeah. Provide yeah. A way of when, when, yeah. When the build system is the coordinator or has a better communication channel p- between it, it can fix a lot of these problems. Yeah. That was kind of where I was trying to go from yeah. there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Victorio. Hey. Yeah. Thank you. Great talk. Learned a lot. I especially like the idea that you can textually include modules. And I was wondering, since we can detect the shape of a program after a pre-scan, is it sensible to have like a hybrid build where for long lines you do the textual inclusion and for Hierarchical, you do the other methods. Yeah, so this was definitely something I was thinking about where you could find um, uh, uh, critical edges or uh, like uh, serialization, or, or, like ridiculous serialization points in, in the build and just duplicate those. So you get this, so you, you get the reuse where, where it's really useful and you get the no serialization where that's useful. So I definitely think that, that, that you can do this with a ahead of time approach. Cool. Uh, so two points. Uh, mm-hmm. One thing which you said earlier that sometimes when you compile things, you get a .o file, and sometimes you don't. And this is based on the contents of the file. No, this is going to be based on the compilation flags you pass to the compiler. There's some different strategies for this, and we haven't fully decided uh, exactly what the trade-offs are there. Like we kind of know. Okay, but the point but is that, that has been finalized. When you specify compiler flags, you will know in advance whether an O file yes. comes up. Okay, good. Yes, yes, you will know. Yeah, because if it didn't do that, it would be hell to integrate. Yes, it would be. It would be right. terrible. Right. Okay. Like if you, if you don't have a dash O for your dot O, we're like we don't know where to put it. We're not going to just like well, drop the, it somewhere. the right. current working directory is a popular choice. But anyway, um, the uh, as for the scanning, the the one of the big problems there is that suppose you do the scanning and everything is fine, and then you build. And then you have files A and B, and one uses the other. And then you edit both and change their contents. So now you can't just build because you build them in the wrong order, because you have the old thing. So you would need to run the scan every time. Yeah, but the scan uh, only needs to look at the files that have changed. Uh, for headers, it also needs to look through those, but it only looks at Yeah, but it also needs to look up how it did. But, but anyway, so if you, so in your model, is there a way, like, like the same thing where you, the, the compiler, talks to the build system using some sort of socket interface or something. Uh, in the fully explicit model, no. You don't, okay. uh, you don't need that. OK, because uh, out of the, all the, the versions that I've seen like recommended for this, this one seems to be like the best thing for integration purposes because it's quite easy to do. If you can, like, we generate the ninja file, then we generate the, the compilation commands database, then do something to get the extra dependencies, and then have ninja use both. Mm-hmm. That would work, yeah. There's, there's a, a yeah, I, I think there's hybrid approaches that work fine. Yeah, 
um, and for, com for completeness. So um, there are other ways of doing this as well. So I wrote a blog post, uh, which uh, examines a model where you would have your, your dependency modules are basically divided into two. So those, if you have like a shared object, a shared library, there are those de module dependencies that are within one module or a shared object. And then there are those which are between them. So if the uh, build system would be in charge of making sure that all of those that are between different shared targets have to be up to date, and then the compiler would be in charge of looking at within one thing, then it could also kind of simplify. And, and that's this, but this would mean that you would have to invoke the compiler in a batch mode, so all yes. files at once. But um, I haven't heard from any of the compiler implementers whether this makes any sense. So if, if you uh, find it and read it and let me know, it will be yes. kind of useful. This so, also so, goes for, for Gabby. Yeah, so, so I, um, on the LVM list, I actually have a, an email talking about this, this batch mode thing where we would have it implicitly figure out the dependencies within a, within a group. Um, and so that's definitely something we want to support. It's just not implemented yet. Uh, so you're on sure. Uh, uh, the primary scenario, sorry. The, the primary scenario at Microsoft is to look at batch mode first, but there is uh, work to be done uh, for the implicit mode, but batch mode. Hi, um, so my question is both for you and like the brain trust in the room. Uh, does anyone know if this is uh, being supported our, um, by Basil or like in the works? Uh, Google has been, well, so Google has been deploying or shipping modules for a few years now uh, internally yeah. uh, with Clang modules. And so I would expect them to fully do the support. I can't speak for them. I don't okay. know if any of the Googler it's people working on that are in the room. I don't see you, Richard. Yeah, that. yeah, but I would I would expect them to. I, I don't have a specific answer though. And then the, the second part is, um, have you um, explored what the like um, the effectiveness of distributed builds with the explicit builds are, or the explicit modules? Um, since now like each task is likely much smaller. Um, it, like, I don't know if you're distributing it in a naive way. Like you might spend more time just moving stuff around than it's so, worth. Well, yeah. So when 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 you do true builds, like Google has, has talked about this uh, a lot because you know their giant true build system. Um, yeah, you do have this overhead for for moving things around, and so uh, and actually Matthias uh, has brought this up a lot. Where it seems different infrastructures for this have had different results between essentially let's ship everything over to the build to the build machine, and it can build all the modules it needs and have its own cache. Or if you want to actually like distribute that across, and I think that just depends on your overhead, your communication overhead. If you have a really low communication overhead, then it's fine. Sure. If it's super big, then then you might not want to. Okay, thanks. But I think it's just trade-off. Um, you said that Google is already using modules internally, and from the from the sound of it, uh, it's a pretty a pretty solid system already in uh, Clang. So my question is. How soon do you think until it's considered stable, ready for production? Yeah. So, so uh, to be to be specific, um, what what's been deployed so far has been Clang modules, which are not the same thing as C plus plus modules. Um, there, there's it's it's very similar to header units, where it's just there's header translation and they're transparently done to modules. They don't do export something and named modules and stuff. So they have a bit of different properties. In terms of full C plus plus module support, um, all three major compilers do have some support. Uh, but there, it's to varying degrees and different things. Like Clang doesn't currently have partitions. I think GCC does. I'm not sure about MSVC. No, for, yeah, so only GCC has partitions right now. And then header units are, uh, I think everyone has them implemented. Um, but Clang additionally supports uh, uh, the Clang modules as header units and stuff. But in terms of timeline, that's, that's really hard to give. Um, I, I, I think it's in a state now to start playing with it. But it's not in the state to start like transitioning over yet, especially if, if you're on multiple compilers, uh, because like all the syntax hasn't been implemented yet uh, for us. Um, and I think uh, most of it's been implemented for GCC, the syntax, uh, except for the private module fragment. Uh, the private module fragment and the semantics of uh, implementation partitions making things not compatible. Yes, yes. And there's actually even, um, um, so like we just filed national body comments and uh, seen a few, and there's a bunch of stuff about like little details in modules. So a lot of little things may change um, in regards to like 
lookup and instantiation and stuff that are just like fixing bugs. And so that part may be a little bit unstable. Um, but like I can't give you a timeline. That's, I mean, maybe Gavi can, but. Uh, yeah, I just, oops. I just wanted to, uh, to say that even after uh, HTML switched to Chromium, you still had components that are modules that are still shipping with, uh, yes. with Freedos, uh, like memory, memory management and, and font library. They have been modularized in the Windows uh, source code. Yeah, yeah. So, so companies that like have compiler teams have been able to deploy modules. Um, but we're still finalizing everything, so, yeah. And uh, you had, uh, so you can import what would normally be an include header as a module instead. Yep. Uh, now, of course, you would parameterize the effects of the import with defines ahead of time. N uh, but, no. Well, what, I mean, like normally without modules, yes. you would do that. Yes. But normally with you modules, what if you do need to do that? What's the standard practice, or how? So, what is the correct way to handle yeah. that? So, so there's two answers to that. Uh, the first is if you want to do it differently in different translation units, which is pretty dangerous. You're 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 asking for ODR violations there. But you know, we do it today. We get away with it. So if you're doing that. You can use the global module fragment. Um, and don't tell your compiler that that's a modular header, because it's not a modular header. Um, and that works fine. If you have the same properties for this header across all of your, your build, then you can just use dash D flags to your compiler. And that currently will feed through. Or um, if you're build, doing this fully explicit build, then just build that header with that dash D. Uh, alternatively, would it be an acceptable solution to have, a, I guess, a shim uh, module that simply performs a standard include, and then yes. you would just import that shim? Yeah, 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 you could do that shim. You could, you could like have it have a different name, say that one's importable, and that the main one's not, and then define something include in that header unit, and do it like that. Okay. And uh, one last question. Um, mm -hmm. So is Clang, as opposed to C-Lang, the official uh, yes. permit? Yes, okay, it thank is you. Clang. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so I have an observation and a question that's mm -hmm. related to that. So before modules, um, when there, whenever something triggers change in the translation unit, we always need to pre-process it, right? It's, it's either the, the source file itself or it's one of the headers. This is no longer the case with modules. So you, you, if a BMI changes, you actually don't need to reprocess the translation unit. Uh, no, you you do have to reprocess everybody that depends on it. Sorry, let me correct that. You do need to recompile everyone that imports that module, whether uh, it, whether they can see that module or not, even if it's a pri like a non-exported import. Uh, no, I'm sorry, probably not expressing myself. Um, Clearly enough, I'm talking yeah. about a translation unit importing a, a module, mm -hmm. an, a named module, not a header unit. Yeah. So if that module changes, if the interface of that module changes. The thing that's importing it? Yeah, that translation unit does not need to be reprocessed. Ah, yes. So that's an observation. That's correct. You do not so, need to reprocess so it. So which, which means that I mean, it might actually make sense to save the partially pre-processed translation units. Yeah, you can separate that out. So so that's an observation. The question is, in which is related to that, don't you think that this pre-scan is a missed opportunity to perform partial pre-processing and saving things and so on? Well, the, the, the partial, like the steps one through three are really fast. Uh, the full pre-processing step, it's not like, I don't think it's worth it. Um, we, we could experiment with that. We could uh, have the, the, the pre-scan step, instead of minimizing it, could not minimize and spit out the full thing. Uh, not minimizing, though, it takes like 40 seconds to do scan all of LLVM and Clang. So like, there's a huge gain in the minimization. Um, and so it's probably worth it to experiment and see if it's worth, more to, if it's worth it to pay more up front to maybe pre-process a little bit later, less later. But I'm I'm not convinced yet on that. Thanks. I wanted to make at least two observations. Uh, the first one is about implicit module lookup. Uh, that is what you refer to as the um, uh, using the uh, the file name and the path as the module name. I first so like the file system that. convention. Yes, the file system convention. 
Uh, I did write a paper about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't been discussed yet, but the idea is to make it a linear lookup, so not quadratic. Um, how would you make it a linear lookup? If you only have a single path to look up, you only have a given fixed set of uh, names that could yeah, possibly yeah. So be. The, the quadratic problem is in that you actually do hit if you just use a file system convention and no coordination, no central coordination, is that you have to check invalidation of the modules when the compiler loads it. That's the quadratic problem. I'll come and discuss it afterwards with you. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one, I s I'm not sure if you were targeting me with the uh, pre-scan uh, being completely correct. I also have a tool that does pre-scans and it is pretty much 99.999% correct based on actually running it on code. Mm -hmm. And the only code that fails is, well, half of it is boost pre-p. So that's not a big deal. <laughs> and it has a big advantage of not needing a build system up front to tell it how to compile everything. So um, you don't need your build system to exist before you can have your build system know where everything is. You need to have uh, all your dependencies listed in your, in your build you, system you well so that you, you can tell where everything listed. is. You don't need the dependencies listed. You just need the files. But you do need the entire compile database, which includes all the dependencies between projects. So the compile edition database does not need to include that. It does not need to include the, if you would import this, uh, use this module. You don't need that part. You just need the flags that impact that build ignoring other, other dependencies. That includes the uh, include directories, includes defines that would yeah, come from other components. Includes. So you do sort of need to have your entire build listed out in order to have the rest automatically generated. But there, there's nothing new here. Like, you don't need anything new. No, that's true. It's like you set up a CMake build and like it just works. Like, so yeah, you can't just point it at, at a, an, a directory with nothing in it, like with no other guidance and have it figured out. Uh, that that yeah. would be my ideal. Uh, but we'll probably take eight hours tomorrow to discuss it further. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I'll talk I, to you I just I don't think that's viable because of like as soon as you want to send a command line option, what do you do? Well, you need to like start like what file do you want to set that command line option on? All of them? Some of them? I don't know. Like, are you even building C plus twenty? I don't know. Like, yes. There's all these questions, uh, and you need some way to answer them. We'll discuss it tomorrow. Yeah. I was wondering were there any scenarios where the change to the uh, interface file did not trigger the rebuild of the uh, BMI? Yeah, so, so that's brought up a lot, um, and I, I touched on it a little. So say you, you're in an interface file and you change a comment. You delete a line out of the comment. Yeah. Cool, I don't need to rebuild anything. Well, um, I need to emit diagnostics. Uh, you have a template in that, in that interface file, and I instantiate it, and, and, and I emit, and I do something bad, and it fails inside of the instantiation of that template. BMIs don't contain source code. They contain source locations. It's referencing that file on disk. Okay. If I try to omit a diagnostic, it's gonna to point to the wrong line. Okay. Um, if you don't care about that, yes, you could, you could figure out a model where you, where you do, A, you do content hashing, or you do like if content hash not changed, don't set, and then like your build system won't need to rebuild because it'll, uh, if you do restat, then the build system will say, oh, nothing changed, I can do that. But then your diagnostics will be wrong. So like, there is potential there, but the, like, the cases you can do it on are so minimal without uh, vastly changing the compilation strategy and structure that we've had for the past like 40 years. Okay, thanks. Cool, cool. and thank you. <laughs>